Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, we catch up with the latest from the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, or WIP site, in Carlsbad, New Mexico. We'll be speaking with Don Hancock, Executive Director of the Southwest Information and Resource Center, who will let us know the latest from that nuclear spitball that shut down after an explosion and radiation leak on Valentine's Day 2014 and hasn't been in operation since. We'll also hear from two brave Japanese individuals taking action and a leadership role on behalf of those who are continuing to suffer from Fukushima's aftermath. Former mayor of Futaba, Katsutaka Idagawa, and activist Ruiko Muto of the movement of Fukushima residents to pursue criminal charges against TEPCO executives and government officials. Both of these interviews are part of the ongoing nuclear hot seat Voices from Japan series. Those interviews, plus numbnuts of the week, activist shout-outs, and more nuclear information than they want to hear about at Dog Park. All of it coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, June 2nd, 2015, and here is the week's anti-nuclear news. We start off in Japan with this interesting sequence of events. On May 27th, Kyushu Electric Power Company received final regulatory approval for restarting Units 1 and 2 of its Sendai Nuclear Power Plant in Japan's Kagoshima Prefecture. That's in the southwest part of the country. This would be the first restart of nuclear reactors in Japan since the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster began on March 11 of 2011. However, Mother Nature seems to have had something to say about this, because on May 29th, a massive volcano erupted, exploding the top off of Mount Shindake on the Japanese island of Kuchino Irabu, just 160 kilometers, 100 miles, from the Sendai nuclear power plant. The very next day, May 30th, an earthquake variously rated at 7.8 to 8. 5 struck off Japan's east coast, shaking the entire country all the way up to Tokyo. And, of course, it was felt at the Sendai nuclear power plant, which is where, on June 2nd, Kyushu Electric Power announced that it has delayed the restart of Sendai nuclear power plant in southwest Japan. No reason for the delay was stated. Catching up with TEPCO, On Friday, May 23rd, the company released documents detailing in depth the analysis of the storage water containers at the disaster site a few months ago. The end result is highly radioactive sludge in the containers that is generating hydrogen gas and puts the entire site in danger of having a hydrogen explosion. Tra-la, tra The leak has now been traced to a water hose that needed to be replaced, but was not because workers on site were busy with other projects. The cracked hose dumped at least 15 tons of water into the drainage canal, which then drained into the port, meaning the Pacific Ocean. And tests showed the highest level of radiation in the water since they started checking two years ago. Hopefully, The workers were reassigned from the projects that they were busy with to take care of this little problem. Thanks to our friend Iori Mochizuki with Fukushima Diary, we now know that TEPCO dropped a major piece of debris into spent fuel pool 3 at Fukushima Daiichi while they were removing debris from that pool. What are you doing, guys? Taking the debris out or putting it back in? From TEPCO's follow-up report, The dropped debris was reported to weigh 400 kilograms, or over 880 pounds. This chunk of equipment, whatever it was, fell onto two fuel assemblies. The company stopped the pool's coolant system for two hours in order to analyze the radioactive density of the pool water. The cesium-134-137 density of the pool water was one 
quadrillion becquerels per cubic meter of water. Now, this may sound extremely high, but according to TEPCO, it's not showing any significant change. Ouch. Moving further into Numnuts territory, the Fukushima nuclear plant has been ordered to upgrade their computer system from Windows XP. This is an outdated version of Windows that no longer receives security updates or technical support from Microsoft. To give you an idea, its initial release date was August 24, 2001. Computer Dark Ages. Not unlike the computers with genuine floppy floppy disks used at U.S. nuclear missile silos. But wait, it gets even crazier. Here's the real... Nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, none that's out of week. Well, whoopee and ring-a-ding-ding. An expensive new facility to provide Fukushima Daiichi workers with hot meals, a place to relax, and an opportunity to socialize was unveiled on June 1st by Tokyo Electric Power Company. How college dorm lounge of them. Why, they are even furnishing it with appliances made by companies that operate manufacturing plants in Fukushima. Mm -mm -mm. Just what those workers wanted. Fukushima plant chief Akira Ono said, This facility represents fulfillment of our pledge to provide better working conditions for the people who have been working so hard at Fukushima Daiichi. I'm glad that by the start of providing warm meals to our workers, their health would be more secured and communication enhanced. Let's get real. Beyond the sheer simple-minded inanity of this blatant PR ploy, this workers' Disneyland of delight, nobody bothered to mention that on May 21st, Japan's Nuclear Regulation Authority announced that they're going to increase the radiation exposure limit for workers in emergency situations, meaning Fukushima Daiichi on an ongoing basis, from the current 100 millisieverts to 250 millisieverts. To put that in perspective, nuclear workers are allowed to receive a dose of 20 millisieverts per year. If that limit is exceeded in any year, the worker cannot undertake nuclear duties for the remainder which is what led to cases of radiation badges, dosimeters, at Fukushima Daiichi being covered over with lead tape so the numbers would not register accurately. And seeing as workers regularly exceed 100 millisieverts in the course of a year, even the Yakuza hasn't been able to bring in enough untraceable homeless people to work on site to be able to fill the demands of management. So if you can't guarantee safety, just raise the limits and voila, the illusion of safety is complete. Doesn't change the science, but who cares about science or radiation damage to workers' bodies when the illusion of safety can be manipulated and all those nukes all over Japan with all of its earthquakes and volcanoes blowing their tops can be restarted. And how bad can it be? Well, according to the Biological Effects of Ionizing Radiation 7, the Beer 7 report from the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, there is no exposure to ionizing radiation that is risk-free. Each one millisievert of radiation exposure is associated with an increased risk of all forms of cancer, other than leukemia, of about 1 in 10,000. For leukemia, it's 1 in 100,000. That means that an exposure of 250 millisieverts raises the chance of all forms of cancer to 1 in 40 and leukemia to be 1 in 400. Further, in August of 2011, then Prime Minister Naoto Kan's office was questioned about the issue of acute radiation exposure. And a representative for Deputy Cabinet Secretary of Public Relations Noriyuki Shikata pointed to the Japanese government having received a report from TEPCO that about six of their workers had been exposed to more than 250 millisieverts. That's right, TEPCO and the government equated acute radiation exposure with a dose of 250 millisieverts. So I am certain 
that the workers at Fukushima Daiichi are all going to be warmed to their hearts. Created on appliances made by companies operating manufacturing plants in Fukushima are going to feel better, more secure, enhanced, their health so well taken care of by the warm meals that are going to be given to them in TEPCO's expansive new facility at Fukushima Daiichi. It's a definition of insanity. TEPCO, this is all yours. You are this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's out of the week. And with all that going on, foreign visitors to Japan hit a record 1.7 million in April. I guess they haven't heard about cesium being found in the Tokyo tap water. Okay, time to hear about what some of the conscious, caring people of Japan, meaning they're not in the government or TEPCO, what these people have been doing to try to institute some sanity to the nuclear conversation. Katsutaka Itagawa, the former mayor of Futaba in Fukushima Prefecture, has filed a lawsuit against the central government and Tokyo Electric Power Company for exposing him to excessive radiation since the March 11, 2011 nuclear disaster began. Itagawa, who has asked Futaba residents to join him in the lawsuit, is seeking 148.5 million yen or 1.2 American dollars in damages. The 69-year-old claimed that sloppy management by the central government and TEPCO caused him to receive radiation over the annual limit during the early phase of the disaster, when hydrogen explosions and the venting of steam from reactor containment vessels took place. Futaba is one of the two municipalities that host TEPCO's crippled Fukushima nuclear power plant, the site of the ongoing disaster. At a news conference on May 20th, Itagawa expressed regrets for his inability to protect local residents from radiation. What Itagawa did not mention at that time was that, in the confusing aftermath of the 3-11-11 accident, amid a dearth of information, he took the unusual step of leading his people outside of Fukushima Prefecture in order to protect them from harmful radiation. Nuclear Hot Seat number 142 interviewed former Mayor Itagawa as part of our Voices from Japan series. This was for the Fukushima 3rd Anniversary Special, which aired originally on March 11, 2014. Here, through a translator, are former Mayor Itagawa's thoughts from that time. He outlines his disappointment and fears connected with the Fukushima Daiichi accident and his concerns about the societal malaise affecting Japan. Three years have passed already. The feelings of regret and frustration caused by the deplorable circumstances of March 11, 2011 continue even now. What is most frustrating is that the government and TEPCO promised us that the nuclear power plant would not cause an accident. As mayor, I sat in my office with those people over the years and discussed the possibilities of an accident occurring. Did they tell the truth? They always said, Mr. Mayor, don't worry. An accident will definitely never happen. Well, the nuclear power plant broke down pretty easily in the earthquake and tsunami, didn't it? It fell apart that easily, didn't it? The operation of nuclear power plants was based on a lie. This accident is proof that nuclear power is an incomplete technology. Furthermore, the nuclear power plant destroyed our town. The town is a public entity, a privately owned, for-profit utility corporation destroyed a public body, our town. I don't think there is another example like this in history. 
horrible things happened after Chernobyl too. But the conditions in this country are different. In Japan, we have the right to self-government. It is the nuclear accident that has broken down this system and set people adrift. And because they haven't received enough compensation, they have lost their futures. The villagers who have lost their dreams are heartbroken. In the midst of all this sorrow, Prime Minister Abe is facing outward and promoting exports of nuclear power plants. Despite the nuclear situation in his own country being unclear and with the cleanup of the accident still not progressing, Abe is trying to pass off defective merchandise as top world-class technology. It's embarrassing, isn't it? As a Japanese citizen, I am truly ashamed. When Japan was a healthy country, we did not try to sell imperfect goods. During the time when Japan valued quality above all else, this would not have happened. Furthermore, the contaminated water from the plant is polluting the Pacific Ocean more and more. I feel humiliated when Abe lies to the world, when he says that the radioactive contamination is completely blocked from spreading further into the ocean. We have to return to our roots. We have a right to go back. It is really unfortunate that there is not a single politician or bureaucrat who has been able to stop this problem. I urge the people of the world to take a look at us. What kind of lives are we being forced to live right now? Even though we are not the ones who caused the accident, we are living in conditions that punish us for what happened. Our dreams, our children's futures, our towns have all been destroyed. We've been swept to the very margins of Japanese society and told to live there in silence. I don't wish these tragic circumstances on anyone ever again. Nuclear facilities bring misfortune on humankind. We all need to raise our voices and demand a safe environment where we can live and children can have dreams. We inherited a clean environment from our parents, but I, as a parent, cannot pass along a clean and beautiful town to my own children. This sad situation can never happen again. Please, don't just help us. Please help humankind. That was Katsutaka Itadawa, the former mayor of Futaba, as recorded for Nuclear Hot Seat number 142 for March 11 of 2014. We also learned last week that more than 20,000 people affected by the 2011 nuclear accident at Fukushima have set up an association to demand an apology and full compensation from Tokyo Electric Power Company and the national government. They include members of 12 organizations suing the utility and the government, as well as people who have been acting individually. As the government of Japan moves relentlessly towards lifting evacuation orders and cutting compensation to the victims, local residents continue to worry about the ongoing decommissioning of the reactors, the cleanup of the disaster site, and water leaks of radioactive water into the Pacific Ocean. The group's joint representative, Ruiko Muto, said those who suffered from the accident have not been fully compensated. She says they want to make their voices bigger by getting organizations to connect with each other. Again, as part of Nuclear Hot Seat's Voices from Japan series, we spoke with Ruiko Muto for Nuclear Hot Seat number 142.
the third Fukushima anniversary edition, which originally aired on March 11, 2014. Ruiko Muto is from Maharu Town, Fukushima Prefecture. She ran a cafe in Tamura City, Fukushima, but was forced to close her shop. Since then, she has been a leader of a large group of Fukushima residents who have filed a criminal complaint against TEPCO and the Japanese government. The case has still not been resolved. Fukushima 原発事故当初、日本の国や東京電力がしたことは、事実を隠蔽すること、事故を過小評価すること、そして基準値を変えること。The government and TEPCO have been concealing facts and playing down the effects of the Fukushima Daiichi accident and changing standards at will. Because of that, we have been exposed to radiation and forced to live in a difficult situation. Three years have passed and the suffering caused by the accident has changed form and increased. In December 2012, Then Prime Minister Noda made a recovery declaration. The nation and Fukushima Prefecture's policy was to decontaminate, repatriate the evacuees, and work toward restoration. A huge decontamination effort began, but there are many areas that have not reached the one millisievert annual dosage standard. Despite this, repatriation is being pushed forward. Recently, Miyakoji Town in Tamura District was the first area to have the evacuation order lifted. There are many places in Miyakoji where the radiation levels are high. In areas where the levels are more than one millisievert, The government is distributing radiation monitors and telling residents to manage on their own. The school had moved their operations outside the prefecture, but they will now have to return to Miyakoji. Some students who are still living in the areas they evacuated will have to travel by bus up to 40 minutes to go to school. Which is closer to Fukushima Daiichi than where they are living. Immediately after the accident, food products from outside the prefecture were used in school lunches. But since the second year, most of the products are from inside Fukushima. There are some people who suggest that we should use the school lunch program to increase consumption of Fukushima products and wipe away. Harmful rumors about radiation. There are some people who suggest that we should use the school lunch program to increase consumption of Fukushima products and wipe away harmful rumors about radiation. Farmers are torn between continuing their livelihoods and their desire to provide safe food products. This contradiction is the burden placed on the dignity of the farmers. Furthermore, plastic bags of decontamination soil and debris cover the rice paddies and line the roads in piles three to four deep as far as the eye can see, and the plastic bags will only last for three to five years. The bags are next to houses and buried under school playgrounds. Amid this, people go about their daily lives. Debris that is under 8,000 back rows per kilogram is incinerated in existing facilities. Debris that is over 8,000 back rows per kilogram will be burned in special incinerators being built by the Environment Ministry all around Fukushima Prefecture. They have not fully informed the resident about these plans. People are divided between those who want to return home and those who still feel uneasy about the situation. If they go back, they don't know whether they will be able to farm and infrastructure like shops and hospitals are still not in place. Elderly people 
who have given up are still living in temporary housing despite having their compensation cut. They do not have enough to eat, and during the new year, there was an emergency SOS project to help them. People who are living in temporary housing are becoming depressed. The atmosphere is becoming antagonistic. Also, government ministries and groups have been promoting various radiation safety and risk communication campaigns that are aimed at children and young people. This situation in Fukushima is still very severe. What do you think is the most serious problem? Children being detained in areas where the radiation levels are high. Also, in the criminal complaint we filed against the Japanese government and TEPCO, the trouble is that there are many plaintiffs, but no specific person that is the perpetrator. When over 14,000 of us initially filed, the case was dismissed. Even though the disaster was man-made, there is no one to take responsibility. I think this is really strange. Furthermore, they are talking about restarting other reactors and pushing nuclear exports when no one has taken the blame for the accident. And yet, victims haven't received enough assistance. Do you have anything to say about the prosecutors in the case? Well, the forensic criminal investigation that we had asked for was not granted. Another problem was the change of venue. We filed in Fukushima, but the trial was moved to the Tokyo District's prosecutor's office. In Japan, you can request that the prosecutor's decision be reviewed by the jury-like panel. We wanted that to happen in Fukushima, but the review took place in Tokyo, too. I think that not doing this in Fukushima, where there are a large number of plaintiffs, was intentional. And listening to the prosecutor's reasoning made me feel like they are lawyers retained by TEPCO. So you're saying that the system allows a change of venue without reason? It's not common, but it is allowed. Was a reason given? We are told that the defendants were in Tokyo and that the Fukushima District Prosecutor's Office sent the case to the Tokyo District Office. I don't understand either of these reasons. Yeah, it is hard to understand, isn't it? Is there anything else that you are involved in, aside from the trial? I'm the lead plaintiff, so that's what I'm mostly doing. But I'm also involved in the collective evacuation trial effort. I'm also helping with efforts to get opportunities for educational exchange programs outside of Fukushima for children. And I travel all over Japan for speaking engagements to talk about Fukushima. Do you have a message for our listeners? Yes. The accident occurred in Fukushima. But this kind of catastrophe could happen anywhere. Therefore, I wish everyone would see Fukushima as their problem, too. Activist Ruiko Muto, as originally heard on Nuclear Hot Seat number 142 on March 11 of 2014. Over to the U.S. now, where a Texas company seeking to store the nation's high-level spent nuclear fuel got a boost on May 19, when a Senate subcommittee forwarded to the full Appropriations Committee a bill that authorizes a pilot program to remove spent but still highly radioactive fuel from decommissioned nuclear sites. Waste Control Specialists, or WCS, wants to store the waste at its facility in rural Andrews County, which was hard hit in recent weeks by the Texas biblical flooding of 2015. 
The site already stores tons of low-level radioactive waste, including that which has been shipped from the waste isolation pilot plant in New Mexico that has been out of commission since an accident on Valentine's Day 2014. You'll learn more about WIP during today's featured interview. Part of what the Senate is setting up with WCS is the shipping of the nation's spent nuclear fuel away from sites where it was generated, something which has never before happened, and raises a whole slew of concerns under the general title Mobile Chernobyl. Now it turns out that Areva Incorporated is set to take a lead role in designing, constructing, and operating this interim storage facility. What's wrong with that? The French nuclear giant has been headed for bankruptcy. Its shares have lost 55% of their value since the beginning of the year, and the company's losses for 2014 exceed 1 billion euros, which is more than 1 trillion American dollars. Not very reassuring. I spoke with Donna Gilmore of San Onofre Safety, who is our movement's expert on dry casks and the problems with them. Her knowledge so extensive that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission invited her to come and lecture at their headquarters to bring their staff and commissioners up to speed on dry cask storage and the problems therein. Donna told me that the Areva canisters are of the thin canister type, with only five sixteenths of an inch of steel between the highly radioactive plutonium-containing fuel rods and all the rest of us. These are thin canisters, thin as in tin cans. Further, the transport cask that Areva created for high burn-up fuel, this is the most radioactive kind, was approved by the NRC by hiding 100% of the justification for the approval as proprietary. This is what shows up in the NRC approval documents. It's proprietary, so we can't tell you. And this is what is being proposed to vouchsafe the safety of our high-level nuclear fuel waste in a flood zone and tornado zone in Texas. The U.S. military is concerned as oil bomb trains, as they are calling them, roll dangerously close to nuclear bomb silos. Since the latest oil train derailment and explosion in Heimdall, North Dakota, a recent report by Rachel Maddow reveals that the U.S. military is very concerned about the proximity of those oil train tracks to the missile silos. There are 150 nuclear missiles buried in the ground under North Dakota. This is akin to the civilians in New York City being concerned because there's about to be a gas pipeline put butt and cheek next to the Indian Point nuclear reactor, only 38 miles from the beautiful island of Manhattan. As the song says, what are those people thinking? What have those boys been drinking? Well, here's another goodie. Sometime this year, on the U.S. Army's Dugway Proving Ground in Utah, radioactive gas is going to be released into the atmosphere. In a presentation to the public made last October, those so-called nuclear experts said that the radioactive gas releases are supposed to be roughly equal to the exposure a person would get from some x-rays or body scans. Nobody defined how many x-rays, how strong they were, how long they would be left on. Just, it's like an x-ray. Forget about it. Reportedly, Utah Physicians for a Healthy Environment are studying the radiation proposal and forming an opinion. We'll try to find out what it is for you. But I bet you can guess. By the way, in 1968, Dugway was in the midst of open-air testing of the nerve gas VX when thousands of Utah sheep began dying. A 1970 report by researchers at the Army's Edgewood Arsenal in Maryland said there was incontrovertible evidence, their word, incontrovertible evidence, that nerve gas killed the sheep. But the Army never has acknowledged that it or the Dugway testing was responsible. 
and we're trusting these people with an atmospheric release of radioactive gas? And some quickies from the NRC. The Riverbend Nuclear Facility in Louisiana experienced a hot shutdown on June 1st, and the reactor had to be scrammed due to low reactor water level. Prairie Island in Minnesota went to hot standby on June 1st because there was a manual reactor trip due to, oh, just a lot of stuff with a feed water pump. And at Cook in Michigan on May 31st, there was a shutdown due to failure of an emergency diesel generator. You know, the thing that's required to keep the reactor cool in case of an accident. Always good to know how our aging, decrepit, dangerous nuclear bombs on the ground in our backyard disguised as nuclear reactors are holding up. One last nuke note from the U.S. University of California officials have decided to shut down a 20-year-old nuclear reactor on the UC Berkeley campus, saying that the political hassling it sparked outweighed its usefulness. Internationally, the food fight over Fukushima and Japanese food is coming to a boil. Since the start of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster, Taiwan banned imports of food from five prefectures in Japan, Fukushima Prefecture and four others that were close by. It also required radiation tests on over 800 different kinds of food imports from that country. However, in recent weeks, Japanese contaminated area products were found illegally imported into Taiwan with deceptive labeling that allowed them to be sold in that country. In mid-May, data from Taiwan showed food imports, primarily green tea, that originated in Japan contained radioactive cesium levels that were below Taiwan's limit of 370 becquerels per kilogram, but above Japan's limit of 100 becquerels per kilogram. So Japan was dumping their too radioactive to sell at home green tea on Taiwan. Can you blame the guys for wanting to block imports? Now the Japanese Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry, and Fisheries has stated that the measures of Taiwan are not based on scientific facts and suggested the possibility to appeal to the World Trade Organization. They're not kidding either because Japan has already launched a trade complaint at the WTO to challenge South Korea's import bans and requirement of additional testing requirements for Japanese food since the Fukushima nuclear disaster began. South Korea expressed regret at Japan's actions and said its ban on some Japanese seafood was necessary and reflected safety concerns. Which is odd because South Korea has imported more than 100,000 tons of fish from Japan even since the nuclear disaster began. But in Australia, it seems that they are still importing seafood and seaweed without any tests in place. Not unlike the United States. We'll have our featured interview in just a moment, but first, Nuclear Hot Seat relies on donations to keep the show going. If you find that we make you laugh, think, help you understand nuclear issues, or just not feel so alone with your awarenesses, help us keep doing it. Go to NuclearHotSeat.com, scroll down on the homepage, and click on the big red Donate button. Whatever you can do to help, merci, gracias, arigato, and thank you. The Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, or WIP site in Carlsbad, New Mexico, is an underground salt repository intended for plutonium-contaminated nuclear weapons waste. We, the American people, were promised that WIP would safely store deadly nuclear waste for 10,000 years, maybe even longer. But after only 15 years of operations, on Valentine's Day, February 14, 2014, a 55-gallon drum of waste from the Los Alamos National Laboratory exploded, contaminating 8,000 feet of the underground facility with radioactive material and also releasing an untold amount of plutonium and americium, highly dangerous radioactive isotopes, into the environment. 
The site has remained shut down ever since that Valentine's Day massacre, though a reopening has been touted by Energy Secretary Moniz for 2016. How realistic is that? To find out, Nuclear Hot Seat again reached out to our expert on all things with Don Hancock. He is the executive director of Southwest Information and Research Center, a nuclear watchdog group headquartered in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Don Hancock, welcome back to Nuclear Hot Seat. Good morning. What is the current status of the cleanup at the WIP site? Well, it depends on your perspective. DOE, Department of Energy, thinks it's going fine, and they're more or less on schedule to try to reopen the facility next spring. The rest of the world that's paying attention knows that they're not going to be reopening in 2016, and there are many unresolved issues that have to happen before they can get reopened, and so the cleanup is not going so well. At a minimum, it's well behind schedule, and at a maximum, we're still talking about trying to operate a facility that's contaminated in ways it was never supposed to be, and so nobody really knows how or whether it can be safely operated. What are some of those issues that still have not been addressed? There are several categories. From a technical standpoint, they don't really know how they're fixing, as they call it, contamination. They're not decontaminating. What they're trying to do with the contamination in the underground is cover it up, literally, by putting bratis cloth, by putting salt on it, and so that's what they're saying they're going to do. They don't know this has never been done in a salt contaminated salt mine. We don't know technically that it'll work, even if it technically works for a week or two or three or a month or two or three, because the mine is always moving around. The floors, the ceilings are moving. If it, quote, unquote, works for a month, doesn't mean that it works for two months or three months or six months or a year or whatever. So technically, they're trying to do something that they don't know will work in terms of having the facility so they can operate it at all. Obviously, they still don't have enough air ventilation running through the mine to do any kind of operation or any kind of major mining. Remember, since February of 2014, they've only been running about 60,000 uh, cubic feet per minute of air through the facility, and it all has to be filtered because the air is, has radiation contamination in it, because you have radiation contamination in the underground. So that's a severe technical problem that they haven't resolved. Does that mean that there isn't enough air for the people underground to breathe? Should they be involved in any kind of work down there? All the workers in most of the underground are wearing self-breathing apparatus. So they have supplied air that they're using, and yes, they need to have that because they shouldn't be breathing in the contaminated air in much of the underground. Some workers can go underground without self-breathing apparatus in the northern part of the mine, which DOE says is essentially not contaminated. The 60,000 cubic feet per minute of air is more than enough for somebody to breathe, but it's not enough to have sort of active mining operations. In other words, it's not just the radiation. Unfortunately, there is diesel equipment in the underground, and depending on physically what people are doing, the more you're exercising, the more oxygen you need to breathe in, et cetera, et cetera. So you can be in the underground at that amount of air, but there are severe limitations in terms of what kinds of things you can do. So, for example, as I mentioned, to operate this facility, you've got to be able to move heavy equipment around, diesel equipment around, which has to be adequately ventilated. To really reopen the facility, you have to do some new mining of, of new rooms. You can't run that kind of heavy mining equipment with that level. And so there's not controversy that there are very limited things they can do in the underground now, which is why they, DOE, are trying to get 
more ventilation into the underground. So when the facility was operating full scale, it could have up to 425,000 cubic feet per minute of air flowing through. So you can see there's a big difference between 425,000 and 60,000. So they are very limited, and they recognize they're very limited in terms of what they can do in the underground. So that's a severe technical problem. A couple of major regulatory problems are out there. Uh, they can't operate the facility without approval of the state of New Mexico, which issues the operating permit for the facility, that permit that DOE has been and continues to violate since 2014. They cannot comply with many provisions of the permit by 2016, so either they're going to try to go forward without complying with the permit, which is not acceptable, or, and their indications are starting to do this, they're going to try to get all the provisions of the permit that they can't meet just changed. Um, but that, that will be very contentious um, if that's what they try to do. Secondly, the Environmental Protection Agency, the federal agency, has some regulatory control over WIP as well, and they're in what's called a recertification process. And, in fact, EPA will be in New Mexico later this month on June 16th and 17th, June 16th in Carlsbad, June 17th in Albuquerque, to hear public comments about whether they should be recertifying and specifically whether the application that DOE put in for recertification is adequate, and it's clearly not adequate because their recertification application doesn't even mention the fact that they had they had a radiation leak and the underground <laughs> is contaminated. So, I, I mean, I've, I've just mentioned a few of the things that they clearly haven't complied with. I think it's clear, and I said publicly and privately to your top DOE officials and to other agencies that there's no way they can be reopened in 2016 when I was in Washington, D.C. a couple of weeks ago, a number of congressional staff who are paying attention also realized they're not going to get reopened in 2016, but DOE still wants to maintain the myth that they will be reopened in March or April of 2016. Let me go back to something about the radiation. In early May, there was information that appeared online from the April DOE town hall meeting in Los Alamos that indicated that up to 592 trillion becquerels of plutonium or equivalent radionuclides were involved in the WIF accident. Are you aware of that statistic, and is it accurate, or how accurate do you find it to be? Well, I am aware of the statistic. The Accident Investigation Board, the DOE's own internal investigation, said there were 10 times less released than that number. They estimated one to two curies in this drum from Los Alamos that they say is the only drum that released. I was at the Los Alamos Town Hall meeting with Ted Weika, the head of that accident investigation board, and I and other people were questioning on how they could be confident in that number since, A, they don't really know what was in the container in the first place when it was packaged in Los Alamos because there aren't records of what was physically packaged in the drum. Two, Intentionally, they didn't look at all of the data of all the radiation that exists in the underground at WIP, in the exhaust shaft at WIP, in the filters at WIP, and in the general environment. So they haven't done the sort of the basic technical research that you would need to come to a conclusion. So on the one hand, I think it is not likely that this low number that DOE is estimating is released is accurate. On the other hand, this more than times as much is based on a whole bunch of other assumptions that related to the respirable particles and uh, how much was released and a lot of other kinds of things. And again, that calculation isn't actually based on the data that does exist and should be available. Again, part of the problem that any estimate has is DOE has 
been unwilling to release all of the radiation survey results since February of 2014 up to today, so we don't actually know, it's not publicly available, the exact amounts of americium and plutonium scattered around all of the southern part of the mine at WIP. The final answer is we don't know how much was in the container. We don't know how much was released from the container. We don't know for sure. I am still not convinced that there is only one container that has been breached. So we don't really know how much it came out. So at this point, there's not good technical support for any of the numbers that various people, including DOE, are estimating. What is it going to take to get the data released from DOE, or is there no requirement that they make it available? I've been asking for the data for months, so I don't know what it's going to take to get it released. Uh, Joe Franco, the DOE website manager, has said on more than one occasion, both publicly and privately, that he wants to release it. The contractor, Nuclear Waste Partnership, publicly and privately, has said they do not want to release it. So why that continuing stalemate exists is unclear. In addition to DOE and Nuclear Waste Partnership, the Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board has been asked to demand it be released and to get it. There's a peer review going on by New Mexico Tech University here in, in New Mexico that hopefully we'll be asking and getting data. So it's unclear what it's going to take. In terms of is there a legal requirement, DOE would say there is no legal requirement that they release all of this information. There's another town hall meeting scheduled for Carlsbad on Thursday, June 4th. Is anything substantive coming out of these meetings, or do you feel that they're just a PR holding pattern on the part of the government? Well, at this point, they're one of the few public processes to provide any information. They're not nearly satisfactory in their own right. So it's important that they happen, but it, they would be a lot better if they were more substantive, both in terms of the presentations that are being made. In other words, what the government and the contractors say at the town hall is what they want to say, as opposed to answering all the questions that people actually have. So they're better than nothing. They're not as good as they could be and should be. That's why we need more technical kinds of discussion. So the, the, the June 17th meeting in Albuquerque is going to have three and a half hours of technical discussions with EPA, contractor, DOE people, members of the public present to go into much more detail than what happens in the town hall meetings, for example. That's a good step, not sufficient in and of itself, but when there are forums that we can have technical discussion, we try to take advantage of them as much as possible. And as regards that June 17th meeting in Albuquerque, will it be live streamed or is there a webinar hookup of some sort so that people at remote locations might be able to follow what's going on? So I don't know the answer to that question. That reminds me that I need to ask EPA about that because it's their meeting. Right now, it is not scheduled to be live streamed or whatever, um, but that certainly is something that would be worthwhile to do. I will bring that subject as well as a couple of others up with EPA about that. Don, thank you so much for your continuing updates on WIP, and we will stay in touch. Great. Thank you very much. That was Don Hancock, Executive Director of the Southwest Information and Research Center, a nuclear watchdog group headquartered in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Activist shout-outs. Thanks, as always, to Erica Gray of the Sierra Club in Virginia for bringing to our attention the Nuclear Regulatory Commission accident reports. Always good for a laugh and a shudder simultaneously. And Donna Gilmore of SanAnofreSafety.org provides background for all of our stories on dry cask storage. Both of these women are aces in our movement, and I'm grateful for their expertise and their input to this show. Here's today's final thought. As Nuclear Hot Seat gets ready to celebrate its fourth anniversary, it's coming up in two, count them, two weeks, I want to find out what you think would make the show better more relevant, more consistent. 
Do you want to hear more on Fukushima? On the engineering and technical side? International stories? Should I be concentrating on North America? Do you want more or less on mining, weapons, the technical side of the issue, the political side of it, nuclear history, media coverage, protest art and music? What is going to make this show better, more interesting, so that it would be irresistible, in your humble opinion, to someone who doesn't know anything about the issue and, at the same time, provide some real tofu on the bones for those of you who follow the issue closely and are looking for those details and insights? It's time for me to kick it up a notch or two. So let me know your best possible suggestions. Politely, please. I am not receptive to abuse or rants. Thank you for understanding. So whatever you've got to say, send it in an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. And if you like the show just the way it is, let me know that too. Kind words are worth the world to me. Meanwhile, as you figure out what you want to say about Nuclear Hot Seat, I'm stepping away from Nuclear Hot Seat for a week, going off to unplug and hug trees. Facebook, I am out of here. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, June 2nd, 2015. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, Dallas Morning News, desmogblog.com, Salt Lake Tribune, and Formable and its esteemed writer Lucas Hickson, Richmond Times Dispatch, LA Times, Beyond Nuclear, Reuters, FukuLeaks.org, Fukushima Underline Diary, and our friend Yori Mochizuki, JapanTimes.com, TheInquirer.net, NHK, Greenpeace, FoodNavigator-Asia.com, YNA.co.kr, Joyce Manning in Australia, Asahi, YLE.fi, that's Finland, DailyMail.co.uk, TheGuardian.com, the Empathy Lacking Lackeys of TEPCO, World Nuclear News, and the World Nuclear Association, and the bright, brave, bold, truly international community of Nuclear Hot Seat on Facebook, which you are all invited to join. Voices from Japan interviews are co-produced with Beverly Finlay Kaneko of Families for Safe Energy. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weaver. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV and is also available on AirProgressive.com as well as iTunes if you search under podcasts. Our archive is available on the website, NuclearHotSeat.com, or on iTunes. And our YouTube channel carries the show under Nuclear Hot Seat Videos. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at NuclearHotSeat.com. We are copyright 2015, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, Reminding you that sometimes it's necessary to step away from the issues, step away from the activism, and recharge those batteries, which is my goal for the next week. So once you've got that in mind, remember that we've all had our nuclear wake-up call. Now don't go back to sleep, because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat, it's the bomb.